Hello and welcome to Doug's Front Porch, a podcast where I get to sit down with friends, old and new, and have honest conversations. Today I welcome to the Front Porch Lisa Harvey, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, and I'm so excited to have you on the show, Lisa, uh, because I know you have great stories and, and, an, and some awesome experiences to share with our listeners. So let's begin by, I'll kind of introduce you real quick. As most of the audience knows, I teach high school German in central Pennsylvania, and Lisa is one of my colleagues, uh, and I'll let her tell her story a little bit here. But uh, Lisa is not a German teacher. Um, <laughs> she did most of her career in special education. And that's what, uh, Lisa, tell us a little bit like where you were born uh, and tell us a little bit about growing up, maybe like your, your, your brothers and sisters. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about how you some found your way to central Pennsylvania and became a special ed teacher. Okay. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me here for your conversation. This is pretty awesome. Uh, <laughs> I uh, would like to start out by saying that um, I was born and raised in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Uh, mom and dad, and I have a younger brother, 22 months younger than myself. His name is Dan. And um, growing up, you know, pretty typical childhood um, in, in school, participated in sports. I played softball and field hockey and um, enjoyed both of those sports immensely. Went to college at Lock Haven University, got my undergrad degree in special education, moved on to um, my master's in special education. And my most recent certification was as supervisor of special ed um, certification. And that's currently a position that I hold within the district as the supervisor of special ed for our district. So when you graduated high school, did you know that I wanted to be a special ed teacher? No, I did not know that. Okay. That you what, wanted to be or I wanted to be? No, that you wanted oh, to be. <laughs> what? You said, why? And I was like, what? Um, no, yes, I did know that I wanted to be a special ed teacher. Um, in high school, I was um, very interested in, in special education. I used to um, utilize my study hall time by going to the special ed classroom. I would sneak out of study hall and go to the special ed classroom to work with the kids. Okay. And, um, I knew early on that that is exactly what I wanted to do. And you could maybe fast forward then into my, uh, once we got married, found out that um, I couldn't have children, but um, my husband and I decided to adopt. And we had put in through the adoption agency a request for, um, the opportunity to adopt a child with Down syndrome. And we um, had one adoption fall through, and we were supposed to originally start out by getting a little boy. Um, that fell through, and we uh, then continued on the process, and we now have um, our daughter, Abigail. We've had Abby now 22 years, and uh, she, in fact, is an individual with Down syndrome. Uh I can only imagine what special ed must have, I'm not trying to say that you're old, however, you are older than me, uh, but I can't imagine what special education must have looked like when you were in high school and thinking about like where it is today. Um, can you even like talk just, a, we're not, we don't have to go too in depth, but what are some of the major changes that have happened that has happened to special education, even from the time that you graduated college and started teaching to where we are today in 2020? Um, I can go back and reference high school in that literally um, when they talk about special ed classrooms being in the basement in my high school, one of the special ed classes um, was located in the basement. Um, it, it, it wasn't a joke. It's not a lie. It, that's where it was. And um, there was a, a, uh, a young man. I still remember his name. I still remember him. I rode the same bus with him and uh, kids would pick on him. And I, from the very start, have never been a uh, shrinking violet. <laughs> no, you are not. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I took the stance even in high school to stand up for this kiddo. And, um, you know, he, he stayed in the Wilkes-Barre area and um, he would always, when he saw my parents, would ask about how I was doing and would, um, it was one of those things that he remembered me. He remembered, you know, that 
connection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my mind, a, a child with special needs is not treated any differently than any other individual, other student. It's just that, you know, the, some folks have some issues in terms of learning. Some folks have some issues in terms of intellectual abilities. But the, the bottom line comes down to everyone's a person. People are people. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So, people. so where we are now, uh, how what are some of the really great advances that we've made or that special education has made uh, recently to take us from those classrooms in the basement of an old high school to uh, the situations that are encountered in most high schools today? Inclusiveness, absolute inclusiveness. You know, we, you know, Doug, we, we just had one of our young ladies in our life skills classroom. She honestly, without manipulation, was the homecoming queen. That's right. This year. Yep. But, yeah. And she um, there, there were young ladies on the court that had said that if they had won, they wanted to give it to the young lady that won. And, you know, it didn't even need to happen that way. She honestly won. So we, we went from a situation of kids being taught in a basement to we've got our, our students in, in special needs classes becoming the homecoming queen and being our school ambassadors as part of the collective group. And it's, it's such a turnaround and shift change from where things were uh, back in the <clears throat> 80s. <clears throat> right. Why, why, why do you think that shift happened? Do you think there's a, there, there's probably not one single event, but what do you think kind of pushed society to make that change? Parents, parents saying my child deserves better. OK. Um, advocacy for kids. You know, my, my child does, doesn't deserve to be taught in a basement. Why can't my child be with other children you right. know, like peers? And, you know, I think there's, there's greater acceptance. I think there's greater understanding. Um, I do believe we have some ways to go in certain areas, but uh, for the general global purpose of things, I think we have a better um, acceptance of individuals with diversity. So you've been in a classroom, you, you taught for a while, and then you moved into a position, what was called, we called it a transition coordinator for, I mean, special ed is full of words that if you're not in education, you don't know, or they, you don't know what they mean. So for the, for those of us, for those listening today, um, can you talk a little bit about what, what your role was as a transition coordinator and what that means? And, you know, someone that has that position in a high school, what is their job? Sure. Um, a transition coordinator was actually... Uh, one of my favorite positions uh, that I held in that as a, a person who works with high school age students, you're getting the opportunity to get the kids out into the community, get them work experience, get them life experience, get them applicable, applicable skills in a variety of areas. It may be getting kids to know how to look at a recipe, find out what you need, go shopping for it, accurately count, you know, do you have enough money? Do you did you get the right change? Come back and then apply the skills of, did you measure the right way? Do we have the right ingredients? You know, just simple things or shopping for the food pantry, um, taking kids out to experience things that they wouldn't normally have the opportunity to experience, even as simple as some of, uh, of the students with special needs may not know how to appropriately have um socialization and recreation type activities. So even going to a state park, well, what's available? How do you access it? What do you do when you're there? What's allowed? What's not allowed? And, you know, getting the, the opportunity to get the kids to look at work experience, education experience, independent living experience is something that was, uh, it was at times a challenge, but other times it was some of the most rewarding experiences that I was able to present to the kids and, and to be able to see the, the excitement for the kids to be able to participate in those activities was amazing. Uh, one thing that has always blown me away about you, and ever since I met you and first came to the school where we teach, is that I came with absolute zero background in special education. Uh, my high school had 
and this would have been in the 90s, but my high school had, of course, spe- special education rooms, but I had zero contact with those kids. They weren't, you know, out. They, I don't even, I honestly don't remember them even having like lunch with us. Uh, maybe they did, but I, it just doesn't stick in my memory. So when I left high school and I went to college, I, I didn't have any contact with special education or, or, or special needs kids uh, at college either. And when I got into teaching, to me, it was such a foreign concept. And I was, it, it frightened me to a certain extent because I had no idea how to, and this really sounds bad, but I had no idea how to interact or uh, how to approach those students because I had no background in it. And I got to know you and what I observed about you and some of the other special ed teachers that I work with is your absolute ease of being and working with those kids and being able to just constantly uh, adapt to the the constantly changing situation that a special ed classroom is or seeing you interact with these kids in the hallway to me that was an absolutely um mind blowing experience and I, I learned a lot just from watching you interact with these kids uh and has made me a much better person a lot more comfortable as i uh, interact with these students now in the hallway, because as you mentioned, in, in the school where we teach, they are included. You do see them walking in the hallway. You do see them going to get lunch, where 20 years ago, that just probably wasn't the case in most high schools in in the United States. Well, so thank you for the compliment. It's It just, it, it always has come natural to me. I've never viewed an us versus them kind of concept. Um, right. You know, it's just something that, you know, if, if, I feel like if I can bring that comfort to other people, you know, that they can see in my actions, you know, and I don't even think it's my actions. It's just how I am that, you know, it's, it's how I interact with the kiddos and it's how, it's how I, you know, I perceive them. And I can tell you that another one of our colleagues, I could, (laughs) I can probably tell you that um, on any given day, I'd go into that room and turn her classroom into a dance party. Um, (laughs) Just by going in and it was a life skills classroom and the kids would see me come in and it like lesson over. <laughs> it was done. Harvey's in the room and that's just it. It, it, it. I took over the room. Um, what do you see are some major challenges to special ed today? Um, maybe people not understanding that in the... I don't think there is a single special ed teacher out there that would that would honestly or intentionally do something egregious to harm a child or deny a child their education. And sometimes the perceptions that are out there are such that it makes people think that we're not giving it our all all the time. And I think that makes it difficult because it doesn't always hold true. Now, I can't tell you there; it, everyone is like that, but for the general population of folks, I also think a factor for, for our district in particular that is, is kind of like a barrier is the um, low so- socioeconomic status of much of our community, which mm-hmm. plays into that and is kind of like a feeder for generational um, families for, um, it just seems like they have difficulty, um, breaking away from that low socioeconomic, um, suppression. Right. Do you feel that at the state level and at the federal level that special ed is getting the funding and the attention that it should get? I think that, um, we're getting there. I think we still have a ways to go. Um, I think it would depend on who's leading the charge and what their perspective is on it. Um, the value for education, the you know, I, I do believe that at our state level, um, Carol Clancy is the state director of special ed, um, and I, you know, f- with this entire pandemic, um, the information that she is pumping out and the guidance that she is giving everyone has been vital. But as far as funding is concerned, you know, there's only so many ways to cut the pie and everybody's got their hand in it. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 
goes for a lot of things, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where do you see special ed uh, it, 10 years from now? How do you think it's going to change in the future? I think you're going to see a lot of progression in, in the direction that we're heading now, where we're getting more folks um, in, in the world of special education doing those um, life-sustaining activities. Um, you know, yes, we need reading. Yes, we need math. But we also need to have those folks also be independent thinkers in terms of, you know, how do I have or how do I do my um, – my stuff for my own independence, or who do I go to, to help support me with this? Right. You know, I, I really think we're going to see a, a, a change in more um, person centered, focused education um, for individuals with special needs, meaning, you know, yes, reading and math are important, but let's make them applicable to real world situations. Let's make your real world situations applicable to what you're going to do moving forward in life. Mm hmm. So your new position now, you are a supervisor, meaning you are supervising special ed teachers in our district. Uh, what makes your job difficult? Whoo! <laughs> wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> Without naming names. No names. No names. Ever. Never, 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 never. No, even, beyond, even beyond like individual personalities that you might clash with or, you know, faculty that maybe... Uh, grows against the grain, but bigger picture, maybe what, what are some things that, that makes your job difficult? I think one of the things is the size of our department, you know, trying okay. to get everybody that is, that is one of the things that just, it, it, it's almost like herding cats, you know, <laughs> you, you get this pile, you know, you get up and, you know, we had a meeting today that there were 72 people on a meeting and it was the special mm -hmm. meeting. So it's, it's getting everyone to, understand what you are communicating and then have them apply it. There are some folks who, um, and, and this makes it difficult and, and I know everyone's learning style is different. You know, there are some folks who you can tell the same thing to 10 times, but still you have to go back for that 11th time of instruction again. And sure. you know, it, it makes it difficult sometimes, but you know, understanding and realizing that everyone's human, everyone makes mistakes, everyone has different learning styles, you know, is, is one of the challenges because that is also time consuming. Um, when, when you've got the, the size of the department that we have, and I'm sure there are other schools that have much larger departments um, than we do, it's just making sure that we've got everyone doing what they need to be doing with deadlines, dead, like, IEPs are legal binding documents that have a start and end date. And there are benchmarks along the way and reminding folks a lot of times, like this is, this is your job and this is your responsibility. I've had a little bit of, um, transitional difficulty in that a lot of folks were my colleagues and now I'm their boss. Yeah. So that kind of made it a little challenging. Um, but it's nothing that, you know, I have to, it's nothing that I don't mind saying, remember, I'm not your colleague anymore. I'm now the boss and we right. have to work through this. So it's not, again, I don't have a shrinking violet personality. Um, and if I need to say the hard things, sometimes I just need to say it. Right. Do you feel that, uh, the, the, uh, the amount of paperwork that is put upon you by the state and by the federal level and, and local level that has to make your job difficult. Yeah. It has to. Yes. <laughs> I don't, I honestly don't know how you keep your head above water, to be honest, looking at it from the perspective of a teacher that doesn't have to deal with all the, the paperwork that a special ed teacher or, you know, their boss has to deal with. I can tell you that it got to a point with my new position that I was um, going into work, starting by around six o'clock in the morning. And there were nights where I didn't leave until 10 or 11 o'clock at night and was actually asked to leave by the janitorial staff. Yeah. Um, and, and it is because during the day, you know, in the work day, you are working with people and questions and parent calls and lawyer phone calls. And how do you deal with this? And we need you in this meeting. We need you at that meeting. But that paperwork that's, that I have to go over still needs done. Right. So after the regular work day, when, you know, we you know, worked with individuals and, and 
help them through their job, then it, it's a matter of, okay, now I've got to sit down and take care of all the paperwork. Yeah. Uh, paperwork sure. is, is astronomical. Yeah, it is. It is unbelievable for, for people that aren't in education. You, we can't stress that enough. It is, it is, it is unbelievable. One last question about special ed I had for you. Yeah. What is one thing that you wish everyone outside of education or outside of special ed knew about special education? Hmm. Special education is um, adapting and modifying to the educational needs of the child. And by doing that, we're growing children. We meet them at where their educational need is and provide them the supports. It's not giving them the answers. It's providing the supports and seeing them grow, watching them grow those growth steps are not going to look like your typical student's growth steps. They are going to be a sidestep left and a sidestep right instead of a forward motion, but it's growth. It just looks a little different. Um, I, I think people need to understand that everyone is capable of learning at their own pace and at their own level no matter what that looks like and across the, the continuum of special needs. Yeah. Well put, well put. Well, let's, let's stop talking shop. Um, sure. Another reason I wanted to have you on this episode is we're currently recording this towards the end of April during the coronavirus shutdown and, and everything that COVID-19 has brought. And you have a very special connection story to share in that your family was personally affected by this disease. Uh, and, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. Sure. And uh, just so that people, you know, there's there's thousands and millions of Americans that are locked up in their homes right now that have no personal connection to this. They just, they hear what's on the news. Uh, and some of them are angry that they're forced to stay home. Some are angry that they uh, are not allowed to do what they want to do. Some are, some are depressed because they lost their jobs. Um, but share, let, let's talk a little bit about your story. Um, I don't even, I honestly don't know where to begin. So I'm going to let you kind of, start talking and then we'll see where this goes. <laughs> sure. Um, this situation hit my family rather harshly. Um, I'm going to back the story up to how it started. Um, March 7th, my brother, who is 22 months younger than I, uh, he and his brother-in-law went to a beer festival in Brooklyn, New York. And, um, you know, my brother is a uh, fan of a variety of beers and special beer clubs, you know, exclusive invitation only type of things. Um, so when he and his brother went to this beer festival, they did an overnight trip. And I don't know if, if you know, if you've gone to any type of festivals where they give you a sample and, um, you know, hey, this tastes good. You want to taste it? And, you, you know, you might drink out of the same glass. Um, he and his brother-in-law had done that. And... Um, they stayed overnight, which, uh, March 7th was a Saturday. They came home on a Sunday. Um, Monday comes around Tuesday happens. And, and Tuesday, my, my brother says to his wife, you know, I'm, I'm starting to feel kind of crappy and blew it off till Thursday when it, it like really started hitting him. He was having trouble breathing a little bit. You know, he felt like he had, what was kind of maybe like the flu, um, had called the doctor, doctor ordered, um, some medication and just because of everything going on, ordered a COVID test. Um, COVID test comes back negative and, um, you know, Thursday happens, Friday happens. He's feeling worse. Saturday comes around and he's feeling lousy, absolutely lousy. My dad um, insisted that he come up to my brother's house to get some paperwork that he wanted from my brother. And my brother said, Dad, you know, I'm really not feeling good. Could you, you know, not come up here? I really don't want to, you know, have to deal with this. Well, my father insisted. And uh, he and my mom drove up to my brother's. My mom stayed in the car. My dad went inside and, you know, dealt with the paperwork that they wanted. And mom and dad go back home then. Uh, that was Saturday the 14th. By Monday the 16th, 
My brother had gotten so bad with not being able to breathe, the fever, the um, coughing, the aches, that his wife drove him to the hospital, to the emergency room. In around there somewhere, there was a second COVID test done. Um, result had come back negative. That's two negatives. Um, he gets admitted immediately to the hospital that he went to because they had done a chest x-ray, they had done a CT scan, and um, he had the classic um, showings in his lungs from the CT scan and the x-rays of what was coming out of China for COVID. By Monday night, they um, had him hooked up to ECMO. ECMO is a heart-lung machine which transfers the blood out of your body and oxygenates it. And um, the cannula to hook in ECMO is the width and, and thickness of a garden hose. They put it into your neck, into your carotid artery. The tubing goes around your body, runs through the ECMO machine, which oxygenates your body or oxygenates your blood and then puts it back in through your groin. He, by Tuesday, also was intubated and um, on a respirator. They had put him in a medically induced coma at that point because he was so bad and declining so quickly. They transported him down to um, Geisinger and Danville from where he was at. And he was uh, Geisinger's first um, COVID, severe COVID patient. In the meantime, while he was down there, um, <laughs> and at this point, you had you had been notified, and you you drove to Danville to be with your brother, or how did that? Because I know you spent a lot of time at the hospital. Right. How did that come about? It came about on Tuesday. Um, like I didn't even know that he had gone to the emergency room on Monday, but Tuesday morning, I had gotten a phone call from my mother asking me if I could go down because of the fact that. Um, they tested his wife who, because she was, you know, my brother, they, uh, they had all the classic signs that he was hundred percent positive COVID, even though we've had two negative tests, right? They tested his wife. She's on 14 day quarantine because my father was in the house on Saturday. He's on quarantine. And because he was then in the house with my mother in their house, she's on quarantine. Right. So because I was nowhere around any of them, I <laughs> ended up, you know, going to the hospital. I, my mom called me and said, can you go down there? And I, and she explained everything. I said, absolutely. So from Tuesday through the following Monday, um, a, a week, I sat outside of my brother's hospital room in the uh, neoscience, uh, ICU uh, looking at him through a glass wall and watching him fight for his life. Because at that point when he got there, they had only given him a 15 to 20% chance of survival. While he was there, he declined and they had to put dial put him on dialysis. When he was put on dialysis, his chance of survival dropped to um, zero to 5% survival. While he was in there, um, that... He went in there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So thir it was either Thursday or Friday. I found out that my dad was really starting to decline and not feel well. My mom and dad went for testing because they were just on quarantine. So they go and get tested. My In the process of all this now, moving forward again... My father's tests and my mother's tests come back negative. So by the following Sunday, that Sunday, we get I get a call from my mother that said she had to call the ambulance to get my ha my father to the hospital because he couldn't breathe. He goes down to the hospital in the town that they live in, different hospital than what my brother's in, and um, they say, oh. He has pneumonia and they put him in a regular room. He's in a regular room for two days. In the meantime, my brother gets transferred to the CICU, critical uh, intensive care unit on that Monday. My dad is now in the hospital, another hospital. 
within two days, they move him from regular room to ICU. He is now intubated on a respirator and on the medically induced coma, just like my brother was. Thursday of that week, um, we get a call from the hospital that the hospital is throwing everything in the kitchen sink at my dad to try to keep him alive, and it didn't look good. Through all of this, no one could be down there with him because mom's still on quarantine at home. Right. Um, my mother on that on Thursday says to me, at least I can't breathe. I am having a hard time breathing. I can't deal with this. I said, get in the car and get down to Geisinger and Danville right now. If you're able to drive, I want you down here. So she's driving. And while she's driving down to Danville, I get a phone call that my father passed away. That was a Thursday. She got admitted that Thursday. At this point, everyone at Geisinger and Danville is, you know, they're following along with what's happening. Sure. So they're like, they, the I CICU doctor, I went to him and said, is I'm going down to the emergency room to let them know that my mother's on the way um, so they can be prepared for her in the situation. He says, let me do it. Let me handle it. I'll have them direct her right into a room. He did that. At that point, she was in the CICU with one room between her and my brother. Then she got moved over to the ICU. Uh, she was there for um, just a little over a week. In the meantime, my brother um, is slowly progressing and getting better. Um, they're slowly removing some of his um, life-saving supports because he's coming through. And he um, spent 25 days hospitalized and then was at a rehab facility. And he just got out of the rehab facility last Thursday. So he's home now. He is home, but has a really, really long um, recovery journey process. journey ahead of yeah. himself. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, but he's alive. You know, I, I right. can't I can't emphasize that enough. You know, he's alive. He's got a long road ahead of him. Um, the prognosis is that his kidneys took a beating, hard mm -hmm. beating. And um, there's a chance in the future that, you know, he, he will need dialysis to survive. Um, he still has a, a lot of fatigue. Um, this is a guy who was a, a six foot, you know, 300 pound uh, sheet metal construction worker. You know, he, he wasn't the, uh, the sloppy guy that sat on the, on the chair, you know, it, right. at, at home, you know, he's, he was the, um, consummate, you know, I am man, hear me roar on construction <laughs> worker guy, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's for him to, to eat a meal. He, um, he's exhausted after he eats a meal. He's exhausted taking steps from his couch to the bathroom and back, you know, that, that peters him out. He's done. And your mother now is, is what, what's her status? She is home. Um, she is doing well. She, and, and I've noticed between, um, her and my brother that they have really good days and really bad days. Um, both emotionally and physically. Sure. Um, sure. you know, I go, I still go two times a week to, um, support both of them. And, um, what we have determined is that since my father has passed away, um, you know, my mother no longer needs a three story house with a basement as well, which makes it four stories, um, just for one person. So right, the, right. the intention is that by the end of the year, we'll have that everything settled, house cleaned out, get the house sold. And, um, she's going to move in with us. I can't even begin to process what you went through you were texting me almost daily updates and i and i there were times where i felt i can't believe she's taking the time to do this because i i knew the situation that you're in and but at the same time i thought maybe maybe she needed to reach out to people maybe that helped her you know helped you in that situation but i i just can't i can't process it all the i the fact that you never had an opportunity to truly mourn to mourn your father. Um, that alone is hard, extremely hard. And then to go through the, the, the up and down roller coaster of emotions that it was sitting there with a piece of glass separating you and your brother watching him fight for his life. I, I just can't, I cannot even begin to, to understand, you know, how you dealt with all of that 
and how you're how you came out on the other side being able to sit here and talk about it so so easily with me and I, maybe it's not easy to talk about but it comes across that way uh, how did all this change you um it for for sure i can tell you that it has made me value what we have right now <laughs> you know the people in our lives value the people in your lives um i had toyed around the idea of staying 3 additional years um after my eligibility for retirement um in the past month that toy around <laughs> has gone it's yeah. not it's not even in the in the cards anymore yeah. um you know as as i speak today um something dramatic would have to happen for me to go back on my thought for that sure um how you know Everyone has said, you know, how did you do it? You know, I've had multiple people say, how did it, how did you handle this? You know, when you're, you, when you're put in those situations um, and, and you're like the last person standing, it, you got to do it. You, you That's right. your drive yeah. and your um, adrenaline and knowing and doing and having to do what's right just takes over the mind, at least yeah. for me. You know, no, I, the, it, one of yeah. the other things that we had to process, which was absolutely difficult, was um, because of all this, the way undertakers process individuals who die from COVID and how everything is shut down right now, the way funerals happen. We- yeah, I can I can speak personally to that. Uh, we lost my grandmother last week, at, not from COVID, but just from well, she was 91 old age, let's say, and but I'm sorry for your but, loss. No, uh, thank you. Yeah. It's, 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 but the, my, the, the, my sorrow right now isn't, isn't necessarily at the sense of losing my grandmother. It's at the sense that we aren't, we haven't been able to, and we're not going to be able to, to mourn and grieve the way that we're taught to, we can't have a proper funeral. We can't have a viewing and there's, hundreds of people that would have come to her viewing yes. but but they can't and there's 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 the there's the loss of closure for us that are still alive in our family but there's also a loss of closure for people that knew her and loved her and it's the same way with your with your father we, we as a society as a people are being denied that right now and, and you know closure with with the loss of a loved one or a friend is so important in the whole psychological um you know aspect of life and the emotional aspect that that's really been extremely difficult. And I, I, I sympathize with you and, and you, you had, you lost your, your father at a time when you had, you were, you were, like you said, you were fighting for your brother and your mother at the exact same time. Um, when people ask you how you did it, it I, I I echo their question. I mean, you told us, you told us how, and I understand your, your answer. It, it, it this this had to have changed you for sure, you know. It, it um, did. It did in the in the fact that, um, and this still could be relatively new and and a raw feeling for me, but my my patience for things has vastly um, declined. Like uh, I I don't have time for nonsense anymore. Right. Um, you know, for me, it, it's time is too valuable, and you know, I I don't want to deal with nonsense. Yeah. Um. You know, going going back to my dad a little bit, he was to have a military burial, and um, that did not happen. He did right. not get all the rights of of a military send off. He did, you know, he was supposed to have all of that, and there wasn't even the opportunity to have the um, presentation of the flag. Yeah. Um. You know, I it ended up that. And this is something that the the undertaker had informed me that because of the timing of my dad's passing, the state had to process and put out to um, undertakers how to proceed with um, the timelines in processing um, the deceased. Oh, okay. And um, he actually gave me the letter that came from the state to show me that, you know, it was because of my father's passing that all these regs and rules have now changed. Wow. And um, my father did not get a normal burial. We, because we didn't know when my brother was going to come out of the hospital, you know, my mom, we, I didn't know her, um, you know, where she would be. 
we had to change everything from a a burial to a cremation. Mm-hmm. You know, and and it's still a change that we we're still dealing with. You know, it, sure, it, it absolutely. Was, it was a, a quick shift change of plans and it was like, all right, mom, you know, you're sick, but I need you to give me an answer here, you know, because Jeez, in, yeah. in their wills, it was, you know, each other was their first and then it went down to my brother and I, you right. know, so I'm the last one and I'm making these decisions, but you know, mom still has all her wherewithal. Come on, mom. You know, what do you want? You know, mom was like, you know, you got to do what you got to do. And, and it's good. That's how we are in this world now. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, Lisa, I don't want to end this interview with that, although the story is important and I think everyone should hear it, especially all those people out there that think this is some kind of joke or hoax um, because it's real and it's affecting millions of people in ways that we still don't even know about, you know, Um, and I thank you for sharing that story so much Uh, and hopefully our listeners can gain some insight and, and, and try to begin to understand what some of our fellow people our fellow americans are going through but i end every uh conversation with 10 quick questions um that i don't want you to think about i'm going to ask the question you answer them and they're totally random okay (laughs) so i'm excited to hear some of these answers actually i'm afraid of the questions (laughs) oh don't be don't be all right here's question number one this is an easy one what is your morning drink of choice coffee how do you take it with cream okay two what is your go-to musical artist or group? Ooh, I just, I turn on um, Elvis Duran in the morning. And I just listen to their talk show. I don't know. I just, I, okay. I, I like dance music. I like party music, dance music. How's that? That's fine. Number three, what movie can you watch over and over again and it never gets old? Mm, Steel Magnolias. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number four. What's the last thing you read? Um, by Brene Brown. It was uh, Dare to Lead. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Uh, five. What's your favorite pizza topping? Mushrooms. Oh, ah, uh, me too. No one ever answers that. That's great to hear. Good. 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 Six. I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Laying on the beach or going for a hike? Oh, beach, baby, all the way. Yeah, I I knew that. I knew that about you. (laughs) Number seven, you have invited me over for dinner. What are you cooking? An Italian specialty. Not sure what, because I'm going to gauge it based on likes and dislikes on your end, but it'll be something Italian. Oh, I eat anything, so... That sounds good. It does, you don't even have to tell me at this point. Something Italian sounds yeah. good. <laughs> what is a dream vacation destination of yours? Uh, Hawaii. Oh, okay. Been so there. you can lay on the beach. Yeah, been there, and I want to go back. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Second, uh, second to that <laughs> is Italy. Okay. Once everything okay. settles down, of course. Sure, of course. Uh, number nine, what's something that you're afraid of? Snakes. Okay, okay. And last question. What job? Other than ones that you've already had, would you love to have? I would actually like to be a voiceover um, person for books or read books for um, Audible. Wouldn't that be an awesome job? I that would, would that. be an awesome job. Well, Lisa, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Uh, we could have just talked special ed the whole episode, but I really wanted to 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 tell be able for you to tell your story in regards to the coronavirus and and what happened to your family and I thank you for that so much for sharing. Thank you for inviting um, me and uh, thank you for allowing me to share the story and it's not I I need to to say that um sharing my story was to impress upon people the severity and the um, intensity in which this can affect a family. And by all means, please just follow the guidelines, follow the rules, do what you're asked to do, and maintain your safety for not just yourself, but for others. Right. Thank you for that message. Well, everyone, thank you for listening to Doug's Front Porch, a conversational podcast with your host, Doug Maidenford. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Doug's Front Porch. Also, please feel free to tell your friends about the show. I'll see you next time on My Front Porch. (music) 